tonight, I'll be presenting the story of a man who simply wanted to make a better home for his children. But little did he know that that would bring them face to face with evil. Stick around for the end of the video. I'll be showing you how to enable your notifications on your laptop and cell phones. The great gods of YouTube have made some changes lately, and a lot of people aren't getting their notifications, so I'll do my best to help you out. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, 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 together. I used to be skeptical of all things paranormal, until this happened. Now I believe, but I wish I didn't. It would be a lot easier to sleep at night. Even now, years later, I wake up at night, plagued by the memory of the screaming man, the child in pain, and the dark ghostly images that turned my world upside down and changed my belief system forever. It was May 2001. I desperately needed to find a place for myself and my three children to live. The lease was up in our small apartment, and I was a single father who was about to be homeless. One evening I received a call from a woman telling me that there was a house for rent. It was a large old house that was in very good shape. She invited me to come take a look at it. You can't imagine the surprise when my daughter and I rolled up on this large old white house. We walked in and it was perfect. The house had two floors with three bedrooms, a large kitchen, and a huge backyard. And the basement had an old butcher shower and a fruit cellar. It was far more house than we ever thought we could get for the price, and we decided we absolutely had to have it. We spoke to the landlady and she gave me an application to fill out. There were a lot of other people looking at the house, so I knew I would have to compete to become the tenant. I handed in my application, and the landlady said, You do realize that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with living in a house this old, right? I said, Oh yeah, I understand. But I didn't really understand what I was agreeing to. Well then, I'll get back to you, she said. She was a strange old lady, and the way she showed the house was not typical. It was more like she was a tour guide at a museum. A week went by, and the phone rang. It was that strange landlady calling to tell me that she had selected my daughter, two sons, and me to live in the house. So that weekend, we moved in. I was removing the last few items from the moving truck, when a car slowed down almost to a stop in front of our house. The passenger leaned out from the slow-moving car and said, I hope you'll be okay in there then sped off. I figured it was just a friendly neighbor. The first night in the house was uneventful. Maybe we were just too tired to notice anything. Or maybe the house wanted to draw us in a little closer before beginning its series of attacks and assaults on us. I did notice something very strange, though. All of the interior doors in the house had an old-fashioned hook and eye latch lock, but not on the insides of the rooms on the outside, as if they were trying to lock something or someone inside of the rooms. The first incident happened when I was in the living room, hanging a picture of two angels. I hung it up and turned to walk away, and I heard a crash. I turned to see that the picture had fallen to the floor. Rehanging the picture once again, I turned away and again heard a crash. The picture had again fallen to the floor. Hanging it for a third time, I started walking away, and I felt a rush of air and something hit the back of my ankle. I turned to see the picture lying at my feet. More determined than ever, I hung the picture yet again and said out loud, Now stay there. And I had to laugh because I was alone. The kids were out on the porch, so who did I think I was talking to? Dad, come see this my daughter called from the front door. I stepped out onto the porch. Sit down and watch this, she said. My daughter pointed to an old man walking down the street towards our house. But as soon as he reached our property line, he quickly crossed the street and continued on the other side. 
No one wants to walk in front of our house, Dad. Isn't that weird? My daughter was right. I sat on that porch for a good three hours watching our neighbors cross the street every time they came near our house. A couple of times I waved to say hello, but they just avoided eye contact, dropped their heads, crossed the street, and walked even faster. Maybe they were just uncomfortable getting new neighbors, I rationalized, trying to make sense from a completely senseless situation. But soon enough, we went in for dinner and just forgot about the whole thing. That weekend, we were doing chores in the yard. I asked my younger son to go inside and bring me the garden hose from the basement so we could clean off the sidewalks. A few moments passed, and I heard him screaming from inside the house. Running inside, I found him standing in the kitchen, shaking. He looked at me terrified and said, Dad, something chased me from the basement. I don't know what it was, but it was big. I told him to calm down and went to check the basement, but I found nothing. Naturally, there was some teasing from his brother and sister about his basement monster. But the rest of the day passed without any problems. We were really happy in that house for the first few days. Unfortunately, that didn't last for long. Monday came. It was the last week of school for my kids, but a really long work week for me. Every day I'd leave for work, and I'd come home in the evening to find every single light in the house was turned on. I put the blame on the children, thinking they were leaving the lights on every morning. However, on Friday, my daughter and I sent my boys to the car while we went through the entire house making sure all the lights were off. But come that night, we came home again to find every single light burning. When I walked into the house, I was a little shaken. There was no logical reason for the lights to be on unless someone had been in our house. I searched the entire place in a panic, but I found nothing. Daddy, it's really cold in here, my daughter called from the living room. What was she talking about? It was hot outside. I was sweating. However, when I stepped into the living room, the temperature dropped a good 30 degrees. That was the first time I felt its presence. It felt like an electrical current running through my body, bringing tears to my eyes and chill bumps to my arms. It passed quickly, and I remember thinking, what the hell was that? As soon as it passed, the room began to warm up again. I got very little sleep that night. On Sunday night, we were all in the living room talking. I was getting ready to leave the next day on a work trip, and we were discussing the kids staying with my mother for the week. They had their backs turned and didn't see it. Only I saw it. There was something standing in the kitchen doorway. I looked again. No, not something. Someone. It was a dark figure of a man. He was solid, but made up of a churning black smoke. He stood there for what seemed like an eternity, then just melted away, disappearing into the air, gone. I figured we had two choices. One, we could run screaming into the night, like those crazy people you see in the movies. Or two, we could get up quietly, leave the house, and figure this all out later. My hands were shaking as I said as calmly as I could, Let's go get a soda and then go see Grandma. My younger son was excited at the prospect of a soda before bedtime, but my older two looked at me as if I had lost my mind. Come on, guys, it'll be fun, I said. I grabbed the car keys and we headed out. As I was locking the front door, we heard a loud scream of a man coming from inside the house. It sounded like he was in pain. It was so loud it could be heard throughout the entire neighborhood, and all the dogs started barking. At a dead run, we headed for the car and I drove to my mother's house. It's all still a blur to this day, but I remember being in a total panic and just trying to get us away from that house. As we pulled the car out of the driveway, my younger son said, Daddy, the basement monster, he's standing in the upstairs window. 
I looked back, and sure enough, the black form was standing at the window, watching us leave. That night, we stayed with my parents. Early the next day, I left for my business trip. I had an entire week away to rationalize what happened. Where else would we go? I put all the money I had, and then some, into moving to that house. We had no other choice but to go back. Besides, I half convinced myself that it didn't really happen, so I picked the kids up from my parents and we went back to the house. That weekend, we explored the big shed at the far end of the property, and we found a number of personal belongings there. My parents told me that it wouldn't be a bad idea to call that landlady and ask her some pointed questions, and maybe find out what was going on in that house. Well, that turned out to be one of the most awkward and strangest phone calls I've ever made in my life. Choosing my words very carefully, I asked her if any of the previous tenants had ever mentioned seeing a ghost. She said she couldn't remember. Now, how can you not remember a thing like that? If someone told me they saw a ghost in my house, I'd remember it, wouldn't you? She did, however, say that there was one female tenant who claimed that her dead father came to visit her, but the old woman said she was crazy. She claimed a lot of the things in that shed belonged to that woman, but she refused to come back and pick them up. The rest of the items in the shed belonged to a man who lived there right before us, but according to the old woman, he left in the middle of the night and left many of his possessions behind. But the landlady claimed that she had never heard anyone talk about the house being haunted, so the phone call wasn't of much help to me at all, and it did nothing to calm my fears. But the rest of the weekend came and went, and nothing much happened. I actually convinced myself that this was just a one-time ordeal, and nothing more would happen. That is, until Monday night rolled around. I was on the phone with my mother and the kids were playing in the bedroom. While on the phone, I began to hear the inside doors rattling. I yelled at the kids to quit playing games, telling them I was on the phone and it was distracting me. Then, the doors rattled again, this time harder and louder. So I scolded the kids again. But before I could finish my sentence, my daughter cut me off. Daddy, I'm in the living room reading and the boys are asleep. Now I'll try to tell you what happened next to the best of my memory. Some of it I remember clearly, but other parts are a blur to this day. But as soon as I heard my daughter's voice, the temperature in the house instantly dropped at least 30 degrees. With it came that feeling of the electrical charge running through my body again. Then a horrible stench that I can only describe as smelling of death permeated the room, and the screaming started, softly at first, then it grew louder and more forceful. I shouted into the phone for my mother to come and help us. We needed to get out of there fast. Then the whole house began to shake and come alive. From above, I could hear something large coming down the stairs. Boom, boom, boom. Then the screaming of a man over and over. My daughter said, Daddy, what's happening? Whatever it was, was coming down those stairs. I had to get to my children. The whole house was alive with noise. The floor beneath me was shaking as I made my way to the bedroom door to get my boys. I felt something was behind me, but I knew I didn't want to turn around to see what it was. Then a new voice mixed in with a man screaming. This time, a child. I made it to the bedroom door, but it wouldn't open. The man and child were screaming so loudly it was rattling the walls. By this time, I was screaming too. I threw myself against the door again and again, but it just wouldn't budge. I kept slamming myself against it until it finally flew open. I told my older son to grab his brother and run to the car. My daughter was in shock at that point and couldn't move so I grabbed her and headed for the front door as I heard the other bedroom door slam open behind us. This thing was on our tail, and I knew I couldn't let it get us. We ran out to the porch, and I slammed the door behind us. 
As we got in the car, we could still hear the noise coming from the house. I drove away and parked down the street where we could still see the house and waited for my parents to arrive. We could see that dark figure searching throughout the house. It moved methodically from room to room, trying to find us. That was our last night in the house. My children never returned, and when I returned to pack our things, I never went back inside alone. Every single person I brought with me to the house all witnessed something paranormal. Whispers, screams, pounding on the floor above. Everybody heard it. I remember what that old landlady said when I handed her the keys. Standing there, the whole side of my arm and torso still black and blue from throwing myself against the bedroom door. She said, Some people are meant to live in an old house like that. And some people aren't. I never thought you were the old house type. Then why did she choose us in the first place? About a month after moving out of the house, a friend called me and said she found something online about the land it was built on. Look up John T. Crow of Union, Missouri, she said. When I did, the face of a man came on my screen. It was the same face that showed up in a picture that my brother took in the fruit cellar the day he was helping me move. The man is famous. The land itself is famous. The history of the house dates back to the Civil War. The place is known as the Screaming House. It was built on land owned by Captain Crow, who was a captain in the Missouri Militia in the Civil War. He lived there with his wife Minerva until her untimely death. It stands on the spot that once held the slave quarters. In none of the historical documents will you ever find anywhere that the captain admitted to owning slaves. They were always listed as belonging to his wife Minerva, who came from Kentucky. There's talk that Minerva had improper relations with the male slaves, which may have led to her death and the deaths of every young male slave on the property. I guess that explains the locks on the outside of the doors. In 1974, a woman living directly across the street from the screaming house took an axe and killed her husband. Then she committed suicide with a gun. In another home across from there, a man committed suicide in front of his young nephew. So there's plenty of reason for that house to be haunted. It seems like the land around it is just plain bad. If you talk to the people who live in the town now, they'll tell you they get physically ill when they get near that house. Others claim it's not just the house, but the entire neighborhood that's haunted. About a year ago, someone I know saw a police car racing there one night, and he witnessed the family running out the front door with their night clothes on. As for what's become of the house today, the old lady turned it into a dog kennel. I guess she ran out of people who would live there. Sometimes I drive past the house, and if I have the nerve, I look in the upstairs window. And there it is. Watching. Waiting. Angry. Sometimes the memory of the screaming still wakes me from my sleep, creeping into my dreams, turning them into nightmares. In my dreams, I see a faceless man standing in the basement, his body covered in blood, washing himself while breathing loudly. It's the very same breathing you'd hear when you were alone with it in a room. Heavy, labored breathing. Yes, I do believe in the paranormal now. And maybe you should too. And now as promised, here's the tutorial. Please note, YouTube is discontinuing email notifications, so you really need to enable them on your laptop or cell phone. First, make sure you're logged into your YouTube account. Second, make sure you're still subscribed to this channel or any other channel to which you subscribe. Sometimes YouTube does unsubscribe people without their knowledge. Since you can't subscribe to your own channel, I'll use Mortis Media for the demonstration. Hit the subscription button, then click the bell notification. The default is set to personalized, but you don't want that because you won't get all the notices. So be sure to change it to all. Third, 
you need to enable notifications on your laptop as well as within the YouTube website. For the laptop itself, go to your computer's settings and enable the notifications. Then, while you're logged into YouTube, click on your avatar in the upper right-hand side of the screen, scroll down to Settings on the right side, then go to the left side and click on Notifications. Now for your phone. Go to your phone settings, go to Apps, find YouTube, and then toggle the notifications to On. This concludes the tutorial from the Professor of Darkness, but if you want extra credit, click on the screen above to listen to more stories so you can stay scared until we meet again, my friends.